this year, Easter is going to send, end up on a Sunday. It doesn't always, but this year it will. And next week is going to be um, the triumphal entry. Uh, what people think of that, of course, is as Palm Sunday. And I've, some of you will remember, I've already told you that it was not Palm Sunday, it was Palm Saturday. Uh, it's the Catholic Church that declared it to be Palm Sunday, um, which is kind of, it's all right, I guess, but uh, it's kind of appropriate that the Lord of the Sabbath would enter Jerusalem on his day, the Sabbath day, don't you think? Um, so then we have uh, the following that, we get the chronology right, with his crucifixion being on a Thursday, not on a Friday. Again, it's the Catholic Church that pushed the Friday uh, as his crucifixion day, and uh, they're wrong, uh, but it was a Thursday. He had his Last Supper on a Wednesday night, which is the beginning of the High Sabbath, which was gonna be Thursday that, that year. Um, so, I'm going to talk about all this in this message today, and some of you have heard some of this before, but you know what? You can hear it again. This is, this is a time of the year when uh, it's good to remind us, each and every one of us, of what we're celebrating and why we're celebrating it. So today I'm going to talk about the triumphal entry, even though that will occur next week. But the following week, well, I will be talking about the crucifixion. And then after that, of course, it will be Easter Sunday. And then what will we talk about? The resurrection. Amen. So it's a trilogy. Triumphal entry. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know, it's interesting I call this triumphal entry because I don't know where I got that from. But then I open up my Bible, the Bible that uh, I, I bought, and this particular section is called triumphal entry. Yeah, kind of weird, huh? So apparently uh, several people got the idea at the same time that it was his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Zechariah 9, verse 9 you know, all through the Old Testament, the coming of the Savior is prophesied. It's seen in so many different ways. We have the prophetic scriptures, absolutely, and it's obvious that it's talking about the coming of the Messiah. But there are other places where it's just underneath the surface. If you look closely, you'll start to see that, that he's being prophesied in so many ways that people just, it just got past them. They didn't see it. On this side of the cross, now this is what's important because they had the, the uh, prophecies from the prophets uh, and that was, that was necessary so that they knew know what was coming. But for, to me, on this side of the cross, to be able to say, oh yes, I see that, I see that uh, there, and uh, yes, uh, of course, the prophets prophesied this, but when you look and find out that it's written underneath, just a little underneath, where they would never seen it, but it's there, I think, for our benefit. It's so that we can look back and say, wow, God actually hid it from them for us to be able to see on this side of the cross, you know? And I've, I've given some of that, you know, uh, Joshua chapter 3, verse 15. There's no way in the world they could have known that, what that was, but it was a prophecy of his coming and restoring order to the fallen universe for us to see, and they couldn't see it. Praise God. He take, takes care of those before and after the cross. Right? Amen. So these words written by Zechariah were written 
about 500 years before Jesus mounted a donkey and rode into the city of Jerusalem as a prelude to his coronation as king of Zion. Didn't occur, did it? Because they hung him on a cross. They killed their king. But that was all supposed to happen. I think about when... Uh, in uh, Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the uh, high priest at the time, or one of them, and uh, he wrote a letter of resignation to the Sanhedrin, uh, and I've seen that letter. And in that letter, he says that um, Jesus, uh, he was going through the scriptures to try to find out if he'd had a hand in the murder of the Savior, you know, and uh, so he's, he's looking through all the ancient scripts and everything, and he said, he goes up to the bedroom, and suddenly Jesus appears in the bedroom with him. And he's terrified, because after all, Jesus has been crucified. So he's terrified, and he's, he says, to, he's uh, or talking to Jesus and uh, uh, kind of apologizing, I guess, and, and Jesus said, look, what you did was supposed to happen. That's all right. You know, it was supposed to happen. Your problem isn't that you had me crucified. Your problem is you're just an evil man. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> so he wrote his letter of resignation to the Sanhedrin saying, I'm not fit to be the high priest. <laughs> So Jesus was supposed to be coronated, but of course it didn't happen. Um, and you know what coronation is. It's when uh, you're placed on the throne. Well, it's God the Father who placed him on the throne, right? Well, the daughter of Zion mentioned in this passage, the king of Zion, daughter of Zion, uh, I suggest that the daughter of Zion is the bride of Christ. Zion being the guiding pillar and the presence of God and Mount Zion is in the strength of God because Zion is actually talking about strength, the mountain of strength. Most Christians are familiar with the account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on, the on what's celebrated as Palm Sunday, but there are implications to this event that go far deeper than the traditional interpretations. And he ended on that day uniquely as king, priest, and prophet. That, uh, that office of high priest and a king and a prophet is uniquely occupied by Jesus Christ. Nobody else in all of history has been able to occupy that, those particular offices at the same time. I notice he did not enter on a white horse as an earthly king would. You know, if a king would can't come back from battle as victorious, he would enter the city on a white horse. And that's not what Jesus did. He entered on a donkey, a donkey, a lowly beast of burden. And I think that that is an extraordinary mark of humility because here is the king of the universe the one who destroyed the power of darkness. You talk about a victory. His victory is without measure. And he comes in on a donkey. <laughs> Jesus entered Jerusalem three times on that Passover week. On Saturday as king, that's in Mark 11, verse 10, it says, Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Most people think that that's praise you, O God. That is not what it means. Hosanna in the highest means save us, Lord. Please save us. And on Sunday, that's on Monday, uh, Saturday, and on Sunday, he came in as priest. So on Saturday, he enters as king. On Sunday, he enters as priest. Matthew 12, 
uh, 21 verse 12. Matthew 21 verse 12 says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he's doing that with each one of us. You know that? We have idols. And hopefully they're getting to be less, less in number all the time. But you know, you've got to be careful of an idol. It doesn't always present itself as an idol. Uh, I hope you're all following me here. There are, there are some things that uh, pretty, well, pretty much captivate us. And we've got to be careful of that. If we're captivated, it, chances are it's an idol. Then on Monday, he entered as prophet, and he cursed the fig tree. Mark 11, verses 13 to 14 says, And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. There's a lot in this to me, but I'll just say this part, this much about it. The fig represents self-righteousness. Now, Israel has been acquainted with the fig, you know, and there's a good reason for that, because what was it that Adam and Eve covered themselves with? Fig leaves, right. Why? Because it represents the fact that they had turned their backs on righteousness of God and sought their own righteousness. So when you lose the covering of God's righteousness, you have to cover yourself with your own righteousness. And that's where as humankind is right now. If you're not a member of the family of God, if you're not in the kingdom of God, then you're covered by a fig leaf. Simple. Understand? When, you, when you're in the kingdom of God, you are covered by the Holy Spirit. You are His covering, not your own, and not your cultures, and not your governments, and not your churches. Amen? There's another thing involved here, too. The fig representing self-righteousness well, Jesus represents submission, and it was his season when he entered Jerusalem, which means that this was not a season for self-righteousness. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. When he entered Jerusalem, it was his season, not a season for self-righteousness, right? And that's what the Sabbath is. And you've heard me preach on this. The Sabbath is not just a special day. In fact, the problem is that we think of it as a special day. We should not think of it as a special day. We should think of it as the covering of the righteousness of God on us, where we speak His words, not our own. We seek His joy, not our own. We seek His character, not our own. You follow me? That's what Sabbath means, remember? It's three Hebrew letters, which says to bring the family together under his covering. That's what it means. That's what the word Sabbath, it's Shabbat, Shabbat, Shabbat. Right, you know, they Sabbath, Shabbath, but Sabbath, but it's, it's Shabbat, made of three letters, which means to bring the family together under covenant contract. That's what it means. So, you know, practicing Sabbath should be every single day, not just a Saturday. Amen. Amen. So, in response, Jesus said to the fig tree, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. I see here Jesus saying, the Hebrews have done their job. They have produced the, the prophets and now they have produced the king 
of the universe. But now all of their ceremonies, all of their rituals, all of their special acts, their, their dietary practices, all of that, gone. Because all of that was self-righteousness. Oh, it carried a message, absolutely. The message was the coming of the Savior and the crowning of him as king of the universe and to make him available to everybody who believed in him. The salvation of all and the destruction of the, the forces of darkness. It meant all that. But what they had done was they did the same thing to everything that came to show his coming. They made an idol of it. That's what they did. And so this was their righteousness, all their ceremonies, all their practices, all their uh, dietary habits. These are all their own covering. You follow me? They, they didn't really understand that these were all shadows of the coming king. Right? And you see that in the second chapter of uh, Colossians, where it says that God, Jesus nailed all of these things on his cross. They were all nailed on the cross. That they were all done away with. Because Sabbaths, new moons, festivals, even dietary practices, they were all fulfilled in Christ Jesus. It says that. You can read it for yourselves. So this is what he's talking about. Let no one eat the fruit of you ever again. In other words, let's get rid of ceremony and ritual. That's what he's saying. They've done their job. They were a foreshadow of my coming and what I would do. But now they're over. Get rid of them. But you know what? Man loves this fig leaf. He does. He loves fig leaves. Most Christians seem to be ignorant of the fact that Jesus entered Jerusalem on a Saturday. This was his triumphal entry, not a Sunday. I'll show how this occurred as we go on. But to see how this all began, we got to go back to Exodus 12, verses 1 to 3, when God told Moses that the sacred year was to begin with a new moon of Nisan, which is an art calendar, the March-April area. And that on the 10th day... A lamb would be purchased, and in verse 6, and there's no way I can get this up here for you. Oh, is she doing it? Look at that. She's magic. She's, she's magic. <laughs> in verse 6, verse 6, Get verse 6. <laughs> there we go. In verse 6, God instructed that the lamb should be kept in the house until the 14th day when it would be killed at sunset. And it's interesting about the year that Jesus was crucified. What's interesting about it is that on the 10th day, the day of the purchase, it was Saturday. Oh, there's a problem. Ah, the ruler said, wait a minute. This is Saturday. This is Sabbath day. You can't purchase anything on a Sabbath day. Therefore, we can't purchase the lamb. Oh, woe is me. What are we going to do? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, I know what. We'll move it to Sunday. So that's what they did. They moved it to Sunday. So instead of being the 10th day of the month, as the Lord said it should be, it became the 11th day of the month. And they rationalized this and justified it by saying, well, after all, you can't buy a lamb on a Saturday. Hmm. But you know what happened? The real lamb, the real sacrificial lamb, ended on the right day. Right? So, then it says... Uh, da, 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 da. Move to the 14th day. Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave my notes here for a second and tell you what happens here. Because they moved the 10th day to the 11th day, 
you keep the lamb in the house for four days. So, on the 14th day, the lamb was to be killed at sunset. Well, the 14th day would make it Wednesday. Okay? 10th day is Saturday, the 14th day is Wednesday. But because they moved it one day, then it had to be on the 15th day, which would have been Thursday. So, it was on Thursday that Jesus was crucified. The adjustment of the day of purchase of the land is a matter of rabbinical record in the Talmud of the Jews and can be found in Lightfoot's commentary on the New Testament from the Talmud uh, and, and Hebraica on page 449 of volume 2. So if anybody wants to check me out on this, they will find it in the commentary of the New Testament by Lightfoot in uh, page 449 of volume 2. And I've taught that truth for many, many years, and then I finally found somebody else, a notable Bible teacher, who says the same thing. And I read this from J. Ver How many of you remember J. J. Verda McGee? I used to really like him. <laughs> he's, he's the one I learned from, uh, said, you know, I'm not always right, but I'm never wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really liked him. He still, you know, you can still listen to him. You can still hear his, his uh, teachings. They're very, very good. So I quote from his commentary on Zechariah. When we consider the beginning of the sacred year of the Jews and the count of 10 days to the purchase of the sacrificial lamb, it is important to know that Saturday was the day of triumphal entry because it tells us the day of Christ's crucifixion, which was not Friday, it was Thursday. Not only that, folks, stop and think about this for a minute. He's three days and three nights in the grave. Can they not count? Can't they count? If he's crucified on a Friday, you cannot possibly get three days and three nights, no matter what you do, for his resurrection on Sunday. And he was resurrected on a Sunday, because that was the barley harvest. So, but if it's a Thursday, it makes perfect sense, because according to Jewish law, a part of a day was a day. So, Thursday afternoon is one day. Thursday night, one night. Friday, day two. Friday night, night three, uh, two. And then Saturday, day three. And Saturday night, night three. So, you can only get three days and three nights in the grave with him being crucified on a Thursday. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But apparently they lost their abacus or something when they tried to figure that out with the Catholic Church, you know. You know what the abacus is? Yeah, it's little beads that you move along and you make you, you count like that. That's the forerunner of the uh of the calculator, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I've seen uh Chinese people with their abacus they are faster than a person with a computer. It's amazing. I don't know how in the world they do it. They're strange people. <laughs> anyway, so turn to Matthew 21, 1 to 14, please, Camille. Like, oh, she's there at the computer now. So you're not doing it by sleight of hand? Yeah, she's trying to get back at me. Okay, one at a time here. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Beth Bethphage, and Bethphage actually means uh, dormant or unripe, you know, and of course that's when Jesus ended was because the fig tree was not supposed to be ripe. It was, now you'd be experiencing the covering of God, not your own covering, right? 
at the Mount of Olives when Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fold of a donkey. Um, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on it on them. <clears throat> And a very great multitude spread their clothes, that is, their covering, on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them out on the, on the road. So some people took off their clothing, covering and put it on the road. And then others cut down palm, leaves, uh, palm fronds, I guess they're called, and put them down for Jesus to go over. I see a message there. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come to enter Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So the king of kings and the Lord of lords entered the city of God on the day of the purchase of the sacrificial lamb. He entered on a donkey representing burden as the prince of peace. He didn't ride on a white horse like an earthly king. In verse 8, we find many laying their clothes on the road before Jesus, while others laid palms, palm branches before him. This was the Lamb entering the city of God, the community of the saints, on the Sabbath day, his day. Sabbath represents the surrendering of the human will to the divine will. That's it in a nutshell. That's what Sabbath is. It's the surrendering of your human will to God's will. Remember that it was <clears throat> when Adam turned his back on God that he had, had to cover himself with the fig leaves of his own righteousness. Can we see here a connection between the laying down of our wills and the removal of our own covering of righteousness as Jesus enters our lives to take his rightful place on the throne of our hearts? Do you need me to say that again? As they were taking off their robes and play, laying them on the road for Jesus to ride over, I see a symbol of us laying down our wills, our covering, the removal of our own covering, our own righteousness, as Jesus enters into our lives to take his rightful place on the throne of our hearts. Trading fig leaves, the fig leaves of our own righteousness, our human righteousness, for the righteousness of God is only done in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he made him, that is, God made the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And what about the others who laid down palm fronds, branches from palm trees, rather than their own clothes before Jesus? Could it be that we have here a picture of the religious sacraments posing as righteousness? On Sunday, his second entry into Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and condemned the pollution of the sacred place with filthy lucre. Can we see him entering your temple and turning over the tables of the money changers and in general cleansing, cleaning the idolatry of unrighteousness from our lives? 
And can you hear him declaring to all that we are a house of prayer for all nations because he cares for all people, all people, not just Jews, not just Gentiles, but all people. <clears throat> These events represent a picture of the spiritual growth that we can take personally. On his third entry into Jerusalem on Monday, he cursed the fig tree. The fig tree is a symbol of the nation of Israel who had replaced the truth of God with self-righteousness and the traditions of men. We see that in Mark 7, verses 6 to 7, where he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, take teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. His challenge of the status quo brought swift retribution from the authorities. The lamb was being prepared for slaughter during the four days that he was in the house of those he loved. Zechariah 13.6 and one will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms? And he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. You know, people are still wounding him. Every time we claim to be his, and we don't act like it. This is one of the things that I learned a long time ago. There are so many ways you can deny him. And you know, people think, oh, I would never deny him. And yet, so often we do. When we don't act in accordance with his holy character, we in fact deny him. Thank God he is so gracious and forgiving. So the authorities of our lives rise up against God's holy presence. They want to get rid of him by crucifying him. And in this and in them, we perhaps see the others who laid branches of uh, palm trees down, cut the branches off themselves to lay down in front of him offering their own human works, their own human efforts, thinking that that will be enough to give to the king. Mark 11, verse 8, repeats Matthew 21, 8, that many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy palms, the leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And again, I believe that the ones who truly surrendered their lives to receive him as Lord stripped themselves of their garments and received a new covering of righteousness, which is the circumcision of the heart. I know I've said it. I want to say it again and again and again because it's so important. And I believe that those others were the ones who called for Christ's death just a few days later when Pilate gave an opportunity to have one prisoner released. And they cried out, release Barabbas. Release the son of the father. They were saying without even realizing it. But God realized it. And God had orchestrated this whole thing with these astounding, astounding things that just defy logic. Absolutely defy logic. But there it is. They happened. He orchestrated the whole thing so that we on this side of the cross could look at it and marvel at the way he put everything together. I'm telling you, the only way that people can deny the Bible as being what it claims to be is those who have never studied it. I've said before, every other pursuit of the truth, whether it's New Age or Hinduism or anything 
that you think, you know, they all promise you in New Age, which is a big collection of uh, mystic mysticism and philosophy, science, philosophy, religion, they all, they're the carrot in front of the donkey. And the donkey keeps following it, but never gets any closer to the carrot, you know? Because every one of them, science, as well as philosophy and religion, they all make great promises. But you know, if you spend enough time pursuing any of them, they will lead you to nothing. Big promises, but no delivery. No delivery. And the only delivery they have in the majority of cases is deception. But the Bible, this little book, tiny little, I mean, you know, I remember buying one for somebody overseas and they picked it up and said, yeah, that's a big book. It'll take a long time to read that. I said, you have no idea. The whole rest of your life. <laughs> and, and it's all here. There is more information in this one book than it is in the Library of Congress or in Google. More information that you will never run out of learning from. This is an astounding thing. But you can't know that until you allow the Holy Spirit to come into you and give you the ability to actually see what this is. This is the mind of Christ right here. This is God. The face of God is right here in this book. So, I don't, I don't know, you know. They talk about quantum physics and all this other stuff that they come up with that just blows your mind. But if they would start to realize that none of it, none of it compares with this book. It's amazing. There's just no words. There's, there are no words, folks. But you know it, don't you? When you get the Holy Spirit, which gives you the ability to understand the things of God, because remember, the Word of God tells you plainly, the carnal mind, I don't care what your intellect is, your carnal mind's not going to understand the things of God. You have to have His mind working in concert with your carnal mind in order to even begin to understand what is in this book. And most people don't take the time or the effort to get that mind. Right? Which is amazing. I've said it before. They will work their tails off to get a university degree, but they won't make the effort to get the mind of God, the mind that God offers us, that we would understand the true secrets of the universe. The truth, the truth above all truths, is His in this word. An astonishing document. Astonishing. So he had it all planned that the ones who were calling for the crucifixion of Christ were actually calling for the freedom of the Son of the Father. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? That's ironic, folks. That's irony. That's the very definition of irony. They were calling, oh, release Barabbas, this murderer Barabbas, you know, release Barabbas. And they were all calling out, release the son of the father. <laughs> just, which, and they don't even know it. Oh, so, that is amazing, just amazing. This is one of the many ironies in the biblical record that shows the divine orchestration of the events. So often we read the scriptures and see in them a record of things of the past, but the word of God is alive and powerful and very much pertains to the very present as well as the future. Praise God for his Holy Spirit that causes us to be confident of our adoption and cry out to God, Abba. Abba, our Father. Galatians 4, verses 6 to 7 declares, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, 
crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know, I watch uh, other ministries on TV occasionally. Not, not often, but occasionally. And it's my practice when I get up early Sunday morning to, uh, very early Sunday morning, to uh, turn on the TV and while I'm getting everything ready and uh, emptying the dishwasher and putting things away and all the other stuff that I do, uh, <laughs> I'm listening to preaching. And I got to tell you, most of the preaching I'm hearing is just the same old, same old, same old, same old, same old. Where is the growth? Where in the world is the growth? You can, you can preach morality until the cows come home. And some of it might stick and some of it might not. And so often, morality is a matter of opportunity, right? And, uh, and consequence. But why is it that we don't know that it's all wrapped up in knowledge of Christ? That as we, as we look at the, the marvels within this book, the astounding, glorious pictures that are in here, They're not just about morality, not just about getting blessings from God and all this other stuff and how to have a better life. And it goes on and on. And, and that's why I'm hearing from pulpits on the, on the TV all the time about how you can you know, please God and how you can get blessings from God as you please Him and all that. And, and I'm thinking, you can preach morality and it, some of it sticks, but if you preach Christ, you got it all, right? It's all found in Jesus. Healing, morality, blessings, curses, everything, everything is there in Jesus. You get to know him and you got the works. And when you getting to know him, it's important to see him in other ways. And that's what I try to do, is show you, look at Jesus from this angle. Look at him from this angle. Look at him from this angle. Look at him from this angle. And as you see all these different angles, they all come together in the one glorious person, Jesus Christ, and his whole character. And you're becoming more and more familiar with who he is, not just as a per person, but as the God of the universe. And when you, when you fall in love with God through Christ, you got it all. Because you know what? You're going to resemble what you love, folks. Yeah. You're going to want to know Him. You want, I'm telling you, this is the best way to get to, to, to really glorify God is to sincerely go to Him in the privacy of your own. Do it in your car. Say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to know you. Amen. Don't just want to know about you, Lord. I want to know you. And he wants to hear that. And then he'll give you the ability, that sixth sense, you know, ESP. <laughs> The sixth sense is the Holy Spirit, folks. He will give you that Holy Spirit will, will, will enable you to see Him in ways that you never saw Him before. He will leap off the pages of this book. You will find yourself glorifying Him, saying, wow, I never saw that before. Here He is. This is Jesus. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Well, 40 years ago, the king ended my life with gentleness 
and forgiveness. And the authorities of human experience, the human experience in me, and human righteousness rose up against him. But you know what? I pushed him down real fast. I said, you know what? Jesus, give me the help, the, 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 give me help to just forget everything I've ever learned. Push it all aside. I just want to know what you have to say. And you know what? He came through. By the power of his Holy Spirit, the work of regeneration begun with me, and those pretenders that were in me were toppled from their positions, and the Lord Jesus replaced them and has ruled ever since. It was a battle, folks. It was a battle. I'm not lying. You know, I tried to live with one foot in the kingdom and the other in the world at the same time, and it pulled me apart until I finally got wise and said, all right, Jesus, it's all you. Nothing else. Nothing else. So I ask you, have you laid down your own covering of human good so that Jesus might ride on it and above it? Has Jesus made his triumphal, triumphal entry into your life? And have you stepped aside and let him reshape you with his word? To be reshaped, to be changed, to be transformed, be, to be transfigured. You know what transfiguring is? It's like being in the likeness of the sun. Yeah. True to his word, Jesus gives sight and ability to walk in his ways to all those who will crown him king and become his tabernacle, his dwelling place. Amen? Amen.